Hello students! In this video we're going to take a look at some of the concepts of assignment 7.1 on freshwater resources. So let's start with hydrology. Here's a review of the hydrologic cycle and you can see we have evaporation showing in red. We get evaporation even as rain is falling, some of it's evaporating. But what's most noteworthy is that we get evaporation from streams. We also get it happening from vegetation, if that vegetation is wet from soil and of course from oceans. And um, when we have precipitation, we have one of two things happen. Either the precipitation soaks into the soil, we call that infiltration, or it runs along the surface as runoff. And um, once it does infiltrate the soil, then we see that we get percolation, where it's going through the ground until, and by going through by gravity, until it becomes groundwater, it recharges our aquifer. And, um, Let's take a look at the first quiz the multiple choice question here. So with this, I'd like you to pause the video and then think about the correct answer and then resume and we'll discuss it. So go ahead and pause now. Okay, welcome back. So uh, I hope that you picked B as the correct choice. And um, when you see MC, by the way, that's multiple choice. If you see MM, that's multiple mark. How can we make A correct? We would have to change that 10% to 1%. And for C and D, I actually got these stats flipped. So 79% is ice caps and glaciers, 20% is groundwater. And here's some diagrams just to emphasize that. You can pause here if you want to take any closer look. And here we have watershed. You know, this idea here, we could say this whole area is a watershed for this main river. But we also see smaller watersheds that feed into it. Like this area right here is a watershed for this little creek. And this next region is a watershed with this, with it for a different creek. Ultimately, they flow to the same place. And San Marcos is in the Atascadero Creek watershed. So Google Maps, here we got San Marcos. Here's the sea lot. There's that creek that runs right behind the fence. And that goes underneath uh, Hollister, comes in, joins Atascadero Creek, and flows out to the ocean. Let's talk about groundwater. You have this diagram from your book, and we can see here two aquifers. One's called a confined aquifer because it's sandwiched between two layers of clay. And as we know from the soil lab, water doesn't go through clay so easily. So that water can actually become pressurized, and if you were to drill a well, the water could gush up on its own spontaneously, and that's kind of nice because you wouldn't need to use a pump. And we can also see, in some cases, springs that naturally come out of the ground. And um, here we see the water table, which is that upper level of the water, um, the upper level of the water that's in the ground. And um, here's a little hydrology question for you. This one's multiple mark. When the Camino Real Shopping Center was built, how did this affect local hydrology? So go ahead and pause it now and think about this, what is your best answer, and then we'll go over the answer. Okay, welcome back. So. Um, do we get decreased infiltration? Yes, we do, because now it's pavement before it was soil. Do we get increased water pollution? For sure. Cars are, you know, they leak oil, even just the rubber themselves, the tires, they, well, they wear out and they have rubber particles in the ground. Even some of the metal from the, the brakes, the brake pads are made of metal. And so even that metal contains a lot of nickel, which um, can be a neurotoxin in high concentrations. So yes, we do get more water pollution, mostly from the cars. We also, um, we get D, um, we actually get increased runoff. So A is actually um, not one of the correct answers. And um, we actually get decreased transportation. So D is not one of the correct answers because we have less trees. And when we have less trees, we, uh, it also gets hotter because there's less shade. And so we get increased evaporation. Uh, this is just another way of showing groundwater. One thing I want to point out here is the water table, how it drops in the area right around where we are pumping, because the water flows very slowly through the ground. I forget how slow, but it's like creepy, super creepy crawly. And um, yeah, I'm going to go to the next. Oh, so this area is called a cone of depression when the extraction is faster than the groundwater flow to replace it. We can see that here too. It's also called a van, uh, Vados zone. And I'm not going to quiz you on that term, so don't worry about it. But I just want to point out here that when we have streams, like um, where uh, a, when a beaver 
backs up water with its dam, that gives a chance for that water to soak in the ground and recharge the aquifer. Sometimes when we see a stream, we actually are having water from the ground um, feeding the stream. And uh, that would be called an effluent stream because it's going from the water, from the soil into the stream. Uh, I often go swimming along the Maria Ignacio Creek in our local um, uh, front country here. And um, there are definitely springs feeding that. So it continues to flow throughout the year, even when it's not raining. Just another diagram, uh, nothing, nothing too new. I just want to point out here that we have our sewage treatment plant near the city because there are sewer lines feeding into that. But if you live out in the rural areas, then you are going to be on a septic system, which we'll take a look at later. And some more things about groundwater. Um, you know, we've already kind of talked about this. So if you just want to pause it here and take it in, go ahead. Maybe make some notes if you want. And um, as far as aquifers go, same idea. You can just sort of take some of this in here. You know, you know the one thing about an aquifer is it's it's you know a bunch of rocks, but rocks have spaces between them. They don't perfectly fit together, and in those spaces is, is where the water can accumulate. All right, so lakes and ponds. Let's take a look at this. We see the different zones here, the littoral zone along the edge there, where you have a lot of vegetation, and with that vegetation, it's supporting all sorts of insect life and um, and birds and bugs. A lot of amphibians hanging out here, so lots of biodiversity. And then vertically, we have the limnetic zone, the top zone, which is where the light can penetrate. And with that, you get photosynthesis being done by plants and algae. And that makes for high dissolved oxygen, which fish like. And then underneath that, you have the profundal zone, which there's not a whole lot happening there because light's not getting there. And, um, and there's just not, there's not much to do. But in the benthic zone, there isn't much light, but there is a lot of dead matter from organisms that have died and sunk to the bottom, which could include both algae and plants as well as animals. So you have a lot of decomposers in the bottom there. And um, so a lot of activity. And because of that, you get a lot of nutrients hanging out there. All right, so let's go ahead and pause it and choose your best answer choice. If you said number four literal, that is correct. And let's go to the next one. Order them from highest to lowest in terms of dissolved oxygen. Well, maybe you, if you recall back to the little demonstration that we did with DO SAG, you know that at the very top of the surface is where you get the most dissolved oxygen for two reasons, really. Water can, oxygen can just um, dissolve directly into the water, where we saw a nice blue rim along the top of our, um, of our bottles. And you, we also have a lot of algae and plants, which are doing photosynthesis, releasing oxygen. All right, so as far as some basic ideas about licks and ponds, um, you might want to pause here. We've already talked about some of these things here. So you can stop and record ideas if you want. Cultural eutrophication happens in many waterways when there are too many nitrates and phosphates. And we call it cultural eutrophication because um, it's from our cultured civilization doing agriculture. And on the left here, we have oligotrophic water body, which means clean, low nutrients, high oxygen. It's the natural state of things. On the right, we get eutrophic, which is polluted with high nutrients. Um, and with that, we get too much growth and followed by too much decomposition, and that's what uses up the oxygen. And it's a very unnatural state. So let's do a little review of wetlands here. Wetlands include freshwater marshes, swamps, and bogs. Wet areas with lush vegetation, they are especially productive and valuable for wildlife. Yet they are often destroyed by human development as they occur in flat areas that can be developed if drained. And we do that all the time, or we have in the past 100 years. Um, we are now only now really beginning to go back and restore some of those wetlands. I was just um, talking with my sister-in-law who visited over spring break from Ohio. And she said that in Ohio, they are restoring some of the wetlands there. So we're getting smarter. And the reason I say smarter is because we know that these wetlands um, provide many environmental services. They help the environment by slowing runoff, allowing water to infiltrate and recharge aquifers. Rather than the water around here rushing directly out to the ocean when it rains, if we can let it sit around in a slough for a while, then we get that recharge effect. Also, they filter pollutants through biological uptake, Plants are really amazing that they can take up um, pollutants like lead, for example, that, um, from the water, 
and incorporate it into their biomass, which is good for us because that way the lead doesn't stay around in drinking water or doesn't get into um, the oceans. And they also protect shoreline habits, habitats from severe storms, such as hurricanes, by slowing down tidal surges and blocking wind. And they often say, you know, one of the worst hurricane disasters we've had in this country was Hurricane Katrina in the New Orleans area. And many people feel like we would have been a ton way off better, <laughs> way better off if we had not drained so many of those wetlands where we would have still had those trees to break up the energy of the storm. And here we see mangrove trees in the Florida Everglades, and they help diffuse hurricane energy before the storm hits land, thereby reducing erosion. And we should point out here that over 50% of all original wetlands in the U.S. have been drained and or filled for agriculture or development, which we've discussed before. I'll just point out here the Bay Area used to be heavily dominated by um, wetlands. So you can see here the Sacramento River, which um, uh, it goes up north at like Mount Shasta area along Route 5. And these are all pretty low-lying areas. It's very swampy-ish. And you can see that these are all, everything that's yellow is, has been levied or filled in. We still have some existing marshes around here, as you can see. All right, and glaciers. Um, not a whole lot here, but we should point out that glaciers are large bodies of ice that move slowly down a slope, valley, or wide area of land. And together with ice caps, they contain most of the world's fresh water. This is Bering Glacier in Alaska, the biggest one in the U.S. It melts a little each year, releasing more than twice the amount of water that is in the entire Colorado River. And I'm going to pause here. We're going to go to part two. Part two is going to be about freshwater use or 